OK, so the meeting is recording. Now I'm going to turn my camera off and pass over to um, to my colleagues. Right, OK, so can everyone see the first slide on the presentation? Um, and um, everyone can hear us all speaking. Brilliant. Good. Great. OK, well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining this webinar. Um, it's going to be a joint presentation between myself and Ali. Um, I'm Julie and I'm the future landscapes officer with the National Park and Ali is a wildlife conservation officer. So this presentation is going to focus on the issues around light pollution. What causes it, its impact and what can be done to reduce it. Uh, combating light pollution is something we can all play a part in, however small that may seem. So the aim is to go through the presentation and if you have any questions, you can enter them in the chat. Um, Katrina is going to be keeping an eye on the chat um, and we can maybe an answer all the questions at the end. Um, so for if, um, how we're doing it is Ali's actually in control, so I'll be needing to uh, just ask her when to change slides. Um, so on to the next one, please, Ali. Right, so for some background, um, Exmoor National Park became an international dark sky reserve in 2011, certified by the dark by Dark Sky International which has just recently changed its name from the International Dark Sky Association. So Dark Sky International is the leading organisation that combats light pollution worldwide. And as well as certifying dark sky places, its purpose is to promote and protect dark skies around the world through education, responsible outdoor lighting practices and public policies. Um, it's not a case of once a dark sky reserve, always a dark sky reserve. Um, as um, to retain the um, certification, Exmoor National Park has to submit an annual report, and it has to include evidence of these these below on the on the slide. So sky quality measurements. This, the quality of the night sky is measured, and its luminance is measured across the National Park annually. And these measurements record sky darkness in magnitudes per square arc second. And the higher the measurement, the darker the sky. So with readings of around 20 or 21, stargazing is at its best, and the stars of the Milky Way are clearly visible. And on Exmoor, they average between 21.3 and 21.8. And the readings are taken several days either side of a new moon, and it has to be done on a clear night, which can be a challenge. <laughs> so um, the second element we have to um, report on is evidence of education and outreach work that is done over the course of the 12 months. So on Exmoor, that includes the annual Dark Sky Festival, but it also includes educational and school visits and a dark sky friendly business accreditation scheme that Katrina runs. Um, it also requires evidence of measures to control light pollution. So that might be planning policies and how external lighting is being improved within the National Park. OK, next one, please, Ali. So the National Park covers, oh, sorry, the Dark Sky Reserve covers the whole National Park and within it there is a core zone which covers the central moorland area and in that area there are only two properties, uh, Pinkery Outdoor Centre and Black Pits Bungalow and both of these are owned by the National Park Authority. So around the core, which is that sort of purple area you can see, there's is a critical buffer zone and in that critical buffer zone, we've got a few settlements. You've got Simmons, Bath and Exford are completely in it. And then we've got part of Wooden, Courtney and Brendan. And then um, Luckham is and is and Brendan, sorry, are right on the edge. So in terms of protection, 
the core zone has to be protected from permanent illumination. And then the critical buffer zone has very strict controls of, on lighting and across the whole national park, good lighting management and design is required. And the stars shown there, the monitoring locations are the current or, or have been since 2011, the locations where we record annually. So you can see they're fairly well scattered across the national park, not just in the, the sort of core zone. OK, thanks, Ali. To put it into context, in terms of light pollution and dark skies, this is a map published by the countryside charity CPRE, and it shows a level of radiance or night light that shines up into the night sky. So the highest levels are, um, are the darkest reds, and the lowest levels are the, the darker blues. So the higher the level of light pollution in an area, the more people's views of the night sky are obscured. So you'll see with Exmoor, it, it sort of occupies an area that's largely classed as the darkest night sky. Um, there are some little pockets of brighter light, including Linton, Porlock Dol and Dolverton, but mostly it's considered very dark. The main sources of light pollution for Exmoor National Park are actually outside the reserve, and particularly from South Wales, um, across the Bristol Channel, but also more locally, we have the urban areas of uh, Barnstable and Minehead, which are closer. OK, next one, please. So what is light pollution? How do we define light pollution? It's also referred to as obtrusive light, and it is artificial light that is needlessly wasted outwards and upwards from the area to be lit. And there are three, three that are widely recognised. The first being sky glow, which is the brightening of the night sky that you mostly see above urban areas. And it's caused by the collective effect of lighting from cars, street lights, buildings, outdoor lighting. And it's all directed upwards and outwards. And it's made worse by um, dust and in the air. And when there is cloud coverage, it can make sky glow worse. A glare is that uncomfortable brightness of a light source, especially when viewed against a contrasting dark background. And in less densely populated and in rural areas, glare will seem relatively more intense than in an urban area. And the third type is light trespass, which is also known as light spill or intrusive light. And this is when light trespasses, unwanted light trespasses, beyond the area that it is intends to light. It applies to property as well as natural habitats. So examples could include street lights, neighbour security lights, as well as domestic outdoor lighting. OK, please. Um, the, the other causes of, of light pollution our internal light spill. So light spill from indi indoors can create light pollution. Roof lights and roof line lanterns throw light directly upwards into the night sky. So those are particularly can be particularly harmful. And large areas of continuous glazing can also have significant impacts. Um, over illumination is the use of light well beyond what is required to perform for that activity. Um, many places have lights on unnecessarily when no one present is present. So this can be, you know, lights are left on all the time, whether it's indoors or outdoor lights. And then the clutter of excessive groupings and clusters of bright lights that can cause confusion and distraction and contributes to sky glow, light trespass and glare. OK, next one, please. Right. So the design of buildings can also make a difference. Light spilling from the interiors. So visible light transmission is the amount of light that passes through glazing. And the higher the value, the more light that passes through. 
In domestic properties, as you see on the left hand side, normal domestic glazing has the lowest impact. Whereas, as I mentioned previously, the large continuous glazing and the roof lights and roof lanterns have a higher level of impact. I mean, in, in commercial properties, um, structural glazing has the highest impact. Um, small office and shop fronts, less impact. And again, the skylights in comparison on it, you know, it's, it's to do with the scale also have quite a high impact. So um, the mo in domestic properties, the most damaging light comes from roof lights and roof lanterns and the large areas continuous full height gazing. But it can be mitigated through design. So during the design process, unnecessary roof lights could be omitted or areas of continuous glazing can be reduced or broken up. And the use of curtains, blackout blinds and shutters can also reduce the light spill from inside. So now I've defined the different types of light pollution. I'm going to hand over to Ali, who's going to describe some of the impacts about the environmental consequences of light pollution. Thank you, Julie. So, yeah, why does all this matter? Well, we know that light pollution has negative impacts on both people and wildlife. Studies have shown that artificial light at night disrupts the natural circadian rhythms of humans. These are what we think of as our internal body clock, which runs on a 24 hour cycle and is principally led by light and night and dark. Disruption of this pattern leads to a range of negative health effects, including lowered melatonin production, which then results in sleep deprivation and therefore fatigue, headaches, stress, anxiety and other health, other related health problems. The starry night sky is a source of awe and inspiration and it can provide a sense of enhanced well-being to those experiencing it. Every year around February, the countryside charity, CPRE, asks people all around the country to take part in the annual star count, which helps them to map where the skies are darkest and where light pollution is most serious. In recent star counts, around half of the population experienced severe light pollution, and they counted 10 or less stars, and only 5% or one in 20 of those taking part experienced a truly dark sky, counting over 30 stars. Uh, a wide range of animals are affected by artificial light, particularly nocturnal species, including bats and other nocturnal mammals, invertebrates, birds, reptiles and amphibians. Animals can be affected in several ways, which I've shown on the right of the slide and I'll just briefly go through. So there, there can be changes to circadian rhythms, which, like in humans, can disrupt their behaviour. For example, artificial light disturbs invertebrate feeding, breeding and movement. It disrupts the activity and reproduction of amphibians. And it's been seen to alter singing behaviour in birds, such as robins recorded singing under streetlights. Some species are attracted to the light. Um, many flying insects are, are drawn to light. UV, green and blue light, which are the short wavelength, high frequency parts of the spectrum, is seen by most insects and is very attractive to them. Male moths are particularly sensitive to light with a, with a UV component. Yet research published by Bug Life estimates that a third of flying insects which are attracted to external lights will die as a result of their encounter due to things like predation, exhaustion and disrupted navigation. This then obviously has knock-on effects as reduced populations of insects impact those for whom they are prey, as well as the night flowering plants which rely on them for pollination. Some species are confused by the light. This can mean that they are unable to navigate by moonlight and starlight, such as dung beetles and migratory birds, and it also increases the risk of collision with buildings. And tragically, animals can be drawn away from natural habitats such as the hawksbill sea turtles in Barbados moving towards the city rather than the ocean, as shown on planet Earth too. Some species are deterred by the light, including rarer and more light-sensitive bat species, such as greater and lesser horseshoe, barbastel and myotis bats, which we're lucky enough to have here on Exmoor. 
The Exmoor and Quantock Oakwoods Special Area of Conservation covers around 1,600 hectares of the National Park and it's designated for its important oak woods and wet woodlands which support a range of important species including Barbastel and Bechstein's bats and otter which are all qualifying features and are all sensitive to external lighting. So you can understand the importance of controlling lighting in taking care of this important designated site. As I said before, short wavelength, high frequency light is that which is most harmful to wildlife. This is the light that is most attractive to insects and also what bats are most sensitive to. Light falling on a bat roost access point will at least deter emergence, limiting their time for foraging and meaning they miss the peak in invertebrate activity, but can also result in complete roost abandonment. This can have really significant effect on the conservation status of a local population, particularly if a maternity roost is affected. So lighting a roost access point is likely to be deemed an offence under the legislation affording them protection. Lighting can also be particularly harmful when it falls on a key commuting route or important foraging habitat. That's things like river corridors, woodland edges and hedgerows, as it can form a deterrent or barrier for the more light sensitive species and can also result in reduced prey for these species who are most light sensitive by drawing the invertebrates out into adjacent lit habitats. On the contrary, some bats um, are more light tolerant and species such as pipistrelles can take advantage of the accumulation of insects near to light sources. However, as they're feeding on the invertebrates, the artificial lighting also increases the risk of the bats themselves becoming prey to birds. As Julie just said, it's, it's also important to be really aware of upwards light spill and reflected light, which can both occur from external lighting and from internal lighting spilling outwards, especially from roof lights and lanterns, as these directly light the night sky. I'm just going to pass back to Julie now. Okay, thanks, Ali. So, um that all leads to the question of you know what can we do to protect the night sky and reduce light pollution um, and ultimately what we're trying to achieve is well installed and adjusted outdoor lighting because that helps to reduce light pollution and in doing so protects wildlife saves energy and protects the quality of the night sky for stargazing so on Exmoor, we obviously, as part of the national as a national park local plan, we have policies within it to control external lighting as part of new developments. So during the process of planning, lighting proposals may or often get changed so that the proposals comply with the policy, and we can also condition. Um, external lighting as part of a planning consent so that it has to be approved by the authority before being installed. But as individuals we can also make a difference because also obviously not all light is part of a new development. So what are the principles and the next few slides are going to illustrate the principles of good lighting. You know we can all make a difference, we can help reduce pollution by choosing dark sky friendly fittings for new lights or when replacing existing and by following these principles. Uh, next one please, thank you. So the principles of good lighting. First of all, lighting should be useful, i.e. it should only light what is needed and all light should have a clear purpose and should not overlight an area. The lighting should also be targeted so it's directed and it points downward so that it does not spill above the horizontal and don't and light shouldn't trespass into neighboring properties. Lighting should also be of an appropriate level so no brighter than it needs to be. Um, 500 lumens or less is suitable for most domestic purposes. And I will go on to a little bit more about lumens on the next slide. Um, lighting 
it, it is also a positive step to control lighting so that it is only used when it's needed. And this may be by use of timers and movement center sensors and for the lights to be turned off when they're not needed. And then the colour of light makes a difference. So warm coloured lights or the light that comes out of warm coloured bulbs of 2700 Kelvin or less and limiting the amount of cool black, white, blue light will all help and make a difference. OK, next one, please. So just to a slightly more technical sort of not in depth because I'm not a technician, not overly technical. But lumens are the measure of light emitted from a bulb compared to um, watts, which was the um, measure of power consumed by a bulb. But as a general rule of thumb, for an LED bulb to achieve 400 to 500 lumens, lumens, that would approximately be the equivalent of a 40 watt traditional incandescent bulb. And in comparison, in terms of energy uses, that's only using four to six watts compared to 40 watts. And for a slightly brighter bulb that is 700 to 900 lumens, you're only looking at seven to 10 watts of power usage, and that'll be equivalent roughly to a 60 watt incandescent bulb. Um, the colour of the light is measured in Kelvin, and as with lumens, it's usually indicated on the packaging. With Kelvin, it may be actually written on the packaging what the Kelvin is, or it may just be described as warm white or cool white. And if you see that, always choose the warm white, white because that will be sort of up to 2700 Kelvin and will be the least disruptive. OK, thank you. So we've got here um, a comparison of, of, of sort of good and bad light fixtures, which are often referred to as luminaires. So on the left, we've got bad fixtures, which are ones that direct light upwards and outwards. Um, this is often either caused by the fittings that are poorly designed or maybe poorly positioned and angled to cause light spill unnecessarily. On the other side, we have the good lighting where this is luminaires or fixed fix, fittings that shield the light so it is directed downwards. So it minimizes outward and upward light spill. And there are a couple of a few examples of, of actual light fittings that you know are purchasable, as it were, on, on the bottom. And the impact of this obviously can be seen by the difference between a light column that has no shielding and puts light out in all directions compared to one that is shielded which directs the light down and means that the night sky is more visible okay next slide please so these graphics illustrate how light pollution can be reduced by applying these principles by bearing them in mind it, it, a few adjustments to the number of lights, their position and angle, their brightness, their light colour and timing can make a real difference. And the more changes that are made by individual households, the greater the cumulative effect in reducing light pollution at a local level. OK, next slide. So this is actually the, the last slide. So um, to sort of sum up, um, the majority of lighting legislation is dependent on UK planning law. Um, Exmoor National Park has a local plan and therefore has local pol has policy on external lighting protect to protect the dark sky reserve, but few local authorities actually have such policies. Um, the South Downs National Park, which is also um, a dark sky reserve, uh, produced a national guide called Towards a Dark Sky Standard. And this is, a, this is a guide that we promote and is available on our website. Um, we've recently also produced a simple guide to dark sky friendly lighting, 
which is also available on the website or is available as a printed leaflet to hand around if you want either option. So we've got some links there or some website addresses for um, Exmoor National Park Dark Skies pages and also CPRE, the Campaign for Protection of Rural England, who are a forerunner, you know, uh, uh, do a lot of work on dark sky protection. OK, so I think that's probably it then, Ali. Yeah, so thank you. Um, hopefully short and sweet, <laughs> but any questions? Thank you both. It's Katrina here. So if anyone's got a question, you can either unmute yourself um, and just start asking the question um, or feel free to put your raise your hand or maybe put a question, type it into the chat. You'll see a little speech bubble. Uh, David, you've put your hand up. Would you like to unmute yourself and maybe turn your camera off if you'd like, but you don't need to? I won't turn the camera on because I've got okay. a terrible, terrible internet connection, but um, it was about the points where the lights monitored in the National Park. And um, obviously it's a good thing that they've been standard for a long period of time because you can compare the change over time. But there was nothing close to Exford. Um, I, I didn't, I wasn't quick enough to check Simmons Bath, but there's nothing close to Exford, which I would have thought was, you know, and it, quite an important point to be monitoring as this is a, a sort of centre of, small centre of population within the park. And I wondered if there's any possibility of adding to those monitoring sites. Um, yeah, there definitely is. Um, we, we, we use this, we've been using the same ones just for that reason that you said to, um, to, be able to see change from year to year but there is no reason I mean when when the when the dark sky reserve was or the application was first put in the whole year that there was an extensive area uh, of monitoring carried out to provide the evidence and to work out where the core area would would be um, at the moment we completely rely or not completely we we have a, a volunteer David Brabham who goes out and that's not you, I don't think, is it? <laughs> but it might be. <laughs> I don't know what you're saying, but um, not yeah, David. Not. No, OK. <laughs> David, who um, does the uh, takes the readings for us annually, um, and I am also a backup to do that. But um, so we we do rely on volunteer help to do that. But yes, I take your point that, you know, it could be there could be more done, especially closer to the settlements. Thanks, Julie. I think one thing that were worth mentioning, David, if if you live in Exford, which it sounds like you do, uh, it, we haven't done it yet, but we because it would need to become from a community. But we would be really keen to support a community if they wanted to become, you know, to get all the residents on board to become really dark skies friendly. And that's certainly something that um, that might be interesting to work with in the future. Um, right. Thanks, David. I'm just going to do some questions from the chat. So in the order they've come in, um, Anne is asking, are there any other dark sky reserves in the UK and what great practice have you seen from other reserves? Um, yeah, um, yes, there are. There are a number of reserves, so um, I can list them for you. It's, um, we've got um, Cranbourne Chase, South Downs. Um, we also have um, Brecon Beacons, North York Moors. Uh, Northumberland and Snowdonia um, and then in Northumberland it's actually classed as a dark sky um, park because it includes Kilda Forest which is outside the national park that's so outside a protected landscape so that's why that's being classified as a dark sky park. Um, in terms of the darkness of the skies Northumberland is known as being the darkest national park dark sky reserve in the UK and Exmoor is second so um, you know we are lucky to have really dark skies. Um, in terms of good practice one thing that I would really love to do um, but it comes down to resources is to have a grant system so that we can go in and retrofit some lights that don't comply because we have few 
you know, um, control over existing lighting. So to have a grant would be fabulous to maybe go into uh, certainly farms and um, maybe look to, uh, you know, sort of replace or change lighting. And I know that that did happen or has happened in Snowdonia. Um, in other national parks, they've also all producing guides and leaflets on good lighting. So we're all sort of coming up to sort of, sort of approaching it in the same way, trying to promote good lighting practice as much as we can to influence existing lighting as, as well as new lighting. So Lovely, thanks, Julie. Um, Ollie has asked, uh, how can we get people to care about protecting and promoting dark skies, especially if they live in bright places where they don't often see the stars anyway? Good question. That's a hard one. Should I um, answer that one? We, yeah, please. I think, that yeah, one, Julie. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think that's all about education and engagement, and that's precisely what we're trying to do um, from Exmoor. So this this session this evening, which we will put on our website as well, um, is part of our educating people to understand why they're important and the effects that they can take to help reduce light pollution. Um, but also, you know, very much our, the whole of the events throughout the festival, which are all about enjoying and understanding the importance of our dark skies. Throughout all of them, we try and um, deliver messages about the importance um, of the dark skies to humans and to wildlife. So um, it's about education um, and, and like with anything within the National Park, we very much um, like to say to people, if you want people to, to learn to understand why they're important, you have to teach them to learn to love them first. So it's all um, part and parcel of what we do. So I, I think hopefully, unless you want to add anything, Julie or I, I think we've answered that. No, absolutely. And um, I think what's quite interesting is that how um, some of the engagement and education work goes on outside the National Park, doesn't it? So school visits to try and engage young children in it may happen, not just yeah, beyond the boundaries of the National Park. And it would be great for that to go even further. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, during the festival, we have people come from you know, we come, they come from the cities and we try and encourage people to come and to Exmoor specifically for our dark skies. Um, so in that way, they then learn about the importance of them and and realise what a you know special quality of Exmoor it is. Because as as you rightly say in your question, um, a lot of people who live in cities don't even realise um, the darkness of a, of a, you know, a truly dark sky. Um, OK, thanks, Ollie, for that question. Um, J and T I've got. Have you any influence over Hinkley Point? The sky glow from there really spoils the sky in that direction. Um, the answer is no, unfortunately, we don't. But we've been um, advised by that once it's constructed, the light levels will go down considerably. It's during the construction that it's worse. But um, the only thing that I can say positively from, from it is that they we've had a um a grant um from the I, I, Katrina, you'll probably remember the name of the trust that was set up but to give money and we've been able to pay for um through that grant from hinkley to set up the dark sky discovery trail and a number of other um dark sky related um events haven't we? is that right that's katrina right. that's right yeah we um we've yeah. had um grants from them to support our dark skies work basically um it's but it's more about the mitigation um and the effect that it's have having on tourism um but we've chosen to to spend it specifically on trying to protect our dark skies but yes unfortunately at the moment um i do agree with you and that's something that we often do discuss but we don't have any as julie says we unfortunately cannot control that um at the moment but we hope it will go down OK, thank you. Next question. How do we get our local street lamps changed to ones that support dark skies? Well, um, it's, there'll be, it's a local authority um, that you would need to approach. Um, just to use an example, in, you know, De it, on Exmoor, it's split between Devon highways and Somerset highways, and both have engaged fully and the lights um, in any of the settlements, not that there are that many street lights, um, are all compliant, except for perhaps one or two, which happen to be 
in Exford um, and they are on a cycle of replacement and I'm trying to get them to replace them more quickly. Um, but um, they also are on timers. So I think after 12 at midnight, they go off and they don't come back on until five or six o'clock. So it's really your local authority, your local highways authority that need to be um, approached. And um, I can't give you on the tips quite how to approach them, but that's your starting point. Um, and I guess the more people that approach them and more that push for it, the more you know, more likely they will change. I think they are yeah, with the work that the CPR, CPRE are doing on the national night light blight map um, is pushing highways organisations to be more aware of this. So it's a sort of gaining momentum, but it's got more momentum in the dark sky places than it has outside the dark sky places. Lovely, thank you, Julie. Um, Bridget asks a good question. I often wonder this myself. She says there seems to be an exponential increase in garden solar lighting. What can be done to control this? Control? Yeah. Unfortunately, we have no control over it. Again, it comes down to these sorts of events and you know raising awareness of the impact. Um, I have to be honest, I'm the same. I, I feel it's a bit of a bugbear for me. I think once you start seeing lots of unnecessary decorative garden lighting, it's, you know, it's sort of, you can't unsee it. And it's a very sensitive issue because really all you can do is approach approach the owners, the people who have the lights, but that's uh, quite a tricky one. So I think it's just mostly just trying to raise awareness, particularly in your neighbourhoods, maybe, your, your local community. I think one thing as well um, that might be worth people investigating the um, um, goodness. What's that? What's that um, group that, that that protect dark skies? The government, um, the all-party parliamentary group, uh, or, that's or the dark one. skies UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one. Um, I know yeah. that certainly um, organisations that we often work with, and one of them is called Go Stargazing which is a, um, a sort of a, a national organisation that um, represent the views of astronomers, but actually their, their interest is just in protecting dark skies. Um, and they say, continually lobby your MPs, um, certainly go to the all-party group and make representations because it's only by people power that anything will change. Yeah. Uh, right, I think we've got one more question. Um, Julian um, asks, how much are planning applications regulated and followed up to help combat further light pollution? Um, shall I go for that one, Ali, or do you want to? Yeah, we could do it between us, couldn't we? Because it's got the yeah, two elements. Yeah, yeah. We, we, Ali and I both comment on planning applications, me from a landscape perspective and dark sky reserve perspective, and Ali from the impact it has on wildlife. So between this, we can influence um, the proposals within um, development, new developments. Um, yeah, most developments on on Exmoor are fairly small scale. You know, you're not going to have large developments. So you're looking at often at individual houses or properties or new farm buildings that have external lights. And so we we work to try and reduce that as much as we possibly can during the planning process, and then um, and often we'll then put a um, a condition on that planning consent through through the planning case officers to uh, that the type of lighting has to be approved by the local authority before it's installed. So we have we have some influence over the planning process. Um, one of the hardest ones we, we we are currently finding is there's quite a lot of applications that include roof lights and roof lanterns and um, seems to be quite a, a design trend for those. And um, we, are, we are sort of trying to rein that back a little bit because um, obviously with roof lights and roof lanterns, with putting the light directly up into the sky, can there's very little you can do to mitigate against that. Um, so 
um, you know, it's just sort of we just we we look at it on a case by case basis on each application as it comes in. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Ali, or was that no? No, I think I think that pretty much yeah it covers everything. I guess yeah. the only thing to say as well is um, when conditions do get put on them, that then obviously comes back to us for review if if a a lighting strategy is is wanting to be added. So if people are wanting to then put on external lights, so it's kind of a second step in the process to try and influence it. Um, but yeah, that's it. <laughs> yes. Thanks. Okay, thank you, everybody. Is um, I haven't seen any more questions coming in. Uh, oh, Bridget is asking, what about sports stadiums? Yeah, um, obviously we don't really have any on Exmoor, but we do find that we can be um, impacted by development outside of the national park. And um, um, so if, for instance, um, one, you know, one, one application relatively recently for uh, an all-weather football practice ground, you know, we were sort of concerned about the impact that lighting outside the national park would have on the national park itself and the dark park, dark sky reserve. So we we sort of keep an eye on um, applications around the park as well uh, and comment and hope that our comments will be taken into account. But obviously we don't have any any direct sway on those, but we hope that you know our our, our thoughts will be taken into account. And um, again, when it comes to the type of lighting, it's all about good practice and keeping you know, lights pointing down um, and about timing, maybe, you know, it's if sort of having set or restricted hours for, you know, the any sports lighting to be on so that it gets turned off. Um, there are certain things we can, you know, we, we can hope will happen, but we can't necessarily directly influence. That's great. Thank you, Julie. Yeah, sorry, um, that was a little um, bit waffly. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, I don't think there's any more questions. Uh, last chance for anyone to get typing. And if not, we'll uh, we'll finish the session. No, that's great. Well, thank you very much um, to you all for joining us. I'll just turn my camera on to say goodbye. I was just going to say, um, um, Katrina, that if anybody wants any links, website links, um, we could send those out if they would like like that. So um, if we could work out a way how that yeah. could be done. I'll, I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll share the um, recording with everyone who's um, registered anyway, because there's some people who haven't joined us but would like the recording. Um, so they'll get the links from there. Um, but also, if you have any questions, I think you've probably all got my email address now. Um, so um, we I can pass them on to Julie or Ali. Um, and certainly, you know, I think just to add one other thing, we do have a, a a small working party with people who are involved in, you know, trying to protect our dark skies and people who are really passionate about it. Um, so if you um, have a particular issue that you want to raise or a particular building that you want to, uh, you know, you feel is a particularly bad offender, um, obviously within our powers, um, we will still try to do what we can do to just try and influence people in a positive direction. So, um, you know, we're always um, grateful to hear from you. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that and maybe see you at some of our other events. I'm just going to stop the recording and let you all get on with your evenings. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.